Qianqi to a Buddhist monk returning to Japan. Brought to the supreme nation by fate, your path here was like dream travel. You floated across the broad blue sea to heaven. Now you leave our land, your Dharma boat light. Moon and water understand the stillness of meditation. Fish and dragons attend your Buddhist chants. I cherish the image of your single lamp, still bright across 10,000 miles. So we continue with a new poet in the series. This is the first poem of Qian Qi. Uh, he has a total of three poems in this anthology. This one, the next one, and then there is a heptasyllabic regulated poem, I think, uh, later on. Who is Qian Qi? Well, Qian Qi is a Tali era poem. I think we've already talked of the Dali period. That was the period just after the Al Nushan rebellion. Uh, the main character, so um, the second half, the early years of the second half of the 8th century. And uh, the main characteristic of, of the Dali era poets is that they're a bit manieristic. That is to say, they imitate, they continue in some aspects the high tang poets and their style, but with much less uh, originality or creativeness than, than the, the high tang poets had shown. The most important of, of, of these poets of these era are grouped into a group uh, which is called the Ten Talents of the Dali Era, the most important of which is Lulun, uh, which we will read about later on. Uh, Qianqi is one of them, as we say, and uh, he led a pretty nondescript uh, uh, life as a typical scholar official, passing examinations, serving in in the provinces and so on. He was a friend of, of Wang Wei in Wang Wei's later years, and uh, in some traditions consider him a uh, successor of sorts, a continuator of the Wang Wei poetry and style. So from that mm, commentary, I imagine he mostly excelled in nature poetry, although the two poems that we have here in, are not nature poetry. So, uh, you know, they, they were not selected for this anthology. So before we enter into the details of the poem, uh, one interesting thing to note is uh, the topic of the poem. So we, we usually explain the poem's topic at the beginning or the main topics. Uh, this is a farewell poem, which is a pretty standard piece. What makes it less standard is that the farewell is of a Buddhist monk, of a Japanese Buddhist monk that came to China to learn Buddhist scriptures and is now returning home. So the main topic is farewell, but it's uh, as important as the farewell element here is the Buddhist element here. In fact, we could say it's even more important than the conventional elements of a farewell poem, because Buddhist images are intertwined with the images of parting and uh, with all the images of this short poem. So it's a Buddhist poem in a way. Uh, important contextual background thing to explain before we go into the poem. Tang China was a cosmopolitan and uh, multinational empire. It extended through most of East Asia, and beyond its frontiers, it still exerted massive cultural influence on some of the kingdoms in its surrounding areas, basically the kingdoms of Korea and Japan and Vietnam. In fact, northern Vietnam at this time was part of the, uh, of the Tang Empire as a province. Now, all of this region was a sinosphere, uh, that is an area under Chinese cultural influence, also areas of Central Asia and Mongolia and Tibet. And uh, China was a cultural center. It was the, not only the most powerful nation in this area, it was also the source of high culture and civilization for these other countries. And it was pretty common for these countries to send embassies uh, of, of representatives of the local, of the national elites, in this case of Japan or Korea or wherever, to go and study uh, and live some years in the Tang Empire and come back then to the empire, to their, to their own uh, kingdoms and uh, uh, diffuse the elements of high Chinese culture. And this was pretty common. And as we said, the Tang was a cosmopolitan empire. So it was very receptive of foreigners. It even, it even made some of them uh, scholar officials. It granted them courtly positions. Now, uh, when the Japanese started sending embassies to China, which was, I think it was in the 6th century, 
And it, they continued until the, probably the 9th century. Uh, so in this period in which the, the Japanese were absorbing everything they could from China, like political institutions, uh, scientific knowledge, uh, culture, literature, writing, they also absorbed religious beliefs. And, and most of these religious beliefs were Buddhism. So the main embassies, official or unofficial, from, from Japan to China were embassies of Buddhist monks that went to China to get up-to-date new translations of the Buddhist scriptures coming from India. And, uh, and uh, well, you know, along the way, they also brought back to Japan not only uh, new religious sects, beliefs, customs, rituals, but also cultural artifacts from Chinese high culture. So these embassies were pretty common, and this poem reflects one of these uh, monks who went to who went to China and returned back to Japan. And you know, they generally, uh, many of them received uh, prestigious posts. In fact, two of the greatest sects of medieval Japanese Buddhism were founded by monks who went to China, collected scriptures, and then returned back to Japan. The the the, the, the Shingon and Tendai sects of Japanese Buddhism. Okay, enough introduction, then let's go on with the poem couplet by couplet as usual. First couplet. Brought to the supreme nation by fate, your path here was like dream travel. So in the first couplet we get, uh, it's not exactly an introduction to the parting of the Buddhist monk, we get the background. Uh, so the background is, in the past you came here, you came here to China in search of scriptures. So uh, the supreme nation, brought to the supreme nation by fate. Of course, the Chinese had a, a very complacent and uh, self-centered view of the world. But, but mm, you know, I've seen another translation of this poem where, where mm, supreme nation is not used. Uh, I think it's uh, the place of knowledge or something like that. But anyway, the idea is you, monk, have come here by fate, you know, uh, destiny brought you here uh, to learn the Buddhist scriptures, and your path here was like a dream travel. So in, in this time, dream travel because traveling in this period between Japan and China, even though they're not that far away, but with the technological limitations of the time, it was a difficult travel. It was almost a supernatural uh, dream-like experience. You had to cross the water. There were many shipwrecks at the time. And remember that in, uh, in, in, in Chinese myths and stories, there are lots of uh, legends about the islands of the immortals being in the East China Sea. So this crossing of the East China Sea by a Japanese monk to arrive to China, the country of Buddhist scriptures, is almost uh, paragoned to a supernatural um, travel, yeah? a dream travel. Yeah? So the first couplet basically states, you came here, you came here for illumination, and you made a big effort, you know, your, your, your voyage here is, you know, almost supernatural. Second couplet. The second couplet gives us a little bit more details about the travel, but also about the return trip, which is going to go the same way, but in the opposite direction. You floated across the broad blue sea to heaven. Now you leave our land, your Dharma boat light. So again, the first line represents this, this traveling, floating on the broad blue sea, on the East China Sea, to heaven. Remember, this poem has a lot of ambiguities or, or double implications in meaning. So heaven, the traveling was, you know, going up and up uh, towards, you know, may, maybe heaven here represents uh, the sky or it represents uh, Buddhist illumination. But the Chinese court is also euphemistically referred to as heaven in, in the Chinese tradition. So you came... You reached the, the highest place, the court, from the sea, and now you're going back. Now you're returning uh, to China. Dharma boat. Dharma is the Buddhist, um, the Buddhist uh, doctrines, you know, the set of Buddhist doctrines. Yeah? Your boat is light. It doesn't contain merchandise or jewels or treasures. It just contains the Dharma, the, the, the Buddhist truth. Uh, maybe some sutra, some texts with a Buddhist illumination, but it's the idea that you're traveling light back to your, to your place. Uh, you got what you wanted to do, which wasn't wealth or power or prestige, it was just the truth, and you're traveling back with the truth. And again, the images of water and boating. Third couplet. Um, the third couplet is the second parallelistic couplet, 
So it includes the companions of this Buddhist monk who has achieved, if not illumination, at least Buddhist truths and knowledge. What is going to escort him in his trip back home? Moon and water understand the stillness of meditation. Fish and dragons attend your Buddhist chants. So here you can see the parallelism quite clearly. Moon, fish, water, dragons understand, attend, yeah, meditation, chants. You know, the, the, the parallelism is quite clear. So you're traveling in the boat through the waters back to Japan. You can see the moon and the water. The moon and the water reflect stillness. Just like Buddhist meditation, which is one of the things that probably the Buddhist monk studied in China, is, you know, meditation, stillness. So the moon's and the water's stillness echo the stillness. So the meditation, as I was saying, the stillness of meditation is echoed by the stillness of the water and the moon, as if they participate in Buddhist uh, rituals. Now, this is the pathetic fallacy, which appears a lot in Chinese poetry. Nature responding to human beliefs, to human attitudes, uh, and so on. The correlation between the micro and the macrocosm. So here it seems the moon and the waters are, are you know, trying to, are being still because, you know, they're resonating with the meditation of the monk. Similarly, the animals of the waters, dragons were, were fish, considered an animal of the waters, Fish and dragons attend your Buddhist chants. Not only people listen to the chants of the monk, but the fish and the dragons come to the surface and listen to the chanting. Yeah, they, they respond to the essential truth of, of, of Buddhism that the monk is, uh, is uh, reciting. Finally, the last couplet. I cherish the image of your single lamp, still bright, across 10,000 miles. So probably the last image is the most effective in the poem. Uh, in his little boat, parting from, from China, probably not so little, I imagine. Uh, if, if the boat, uh, this is probably a poetic conceit, uh, you know, if the boat was to, to be able to, to weather the East China Sea, it would have needed to be relatively sturdy. But anyway, uh, the, the poem does not say that the boat is small. He says his, uh, his boat is your Dharma boat light. It's light, but not necessarily a small skiff or a small boat. So in that boat, there is a lamp, um, which is illuminating uh, the, the quarters where, where the Buddhist monk is, uh, probably reading or praying or whatever. The light from that lamp is seen in, in, in Chiang Chi's conceit, is seen through 10,000 miles. So uh, the light of the lamp in the boat, as the boat is receding and as Chiang Chi is relishing this image, of his friend and monk parting with the light on at night in his boat, of course, has a, a very patently obvious uh, double symbolism. So it, it might be the real lamp, which uh, the boat has, light in the darkness, but it's also the lamp of Buddhist knowledge, the light of Buddhist knowledge uh, of illumination, which is being taken to Japan. Uh, this little monk and his lamp are the light of truth that is traveling, uh, shining in the darkness, and that is going to take the Dharma to Japan. And so this image of the truth as a light surrounded by darkness traveling you know, is a very common one in many cultures. And just think about the beginning of the Gospel of, of, of John. It has uh, a beautiful series of lines which include the same image where the light represents the Logos, that is the word, the truth, and Jesus. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not been able to extinguish it. So with this beautiful image, the poem finishes. So quite a nice poem, quite a nice poem.